Um, thanks for joining us for our first part of the our webinar series, um, Equine Health and Welfare. Um, thanks to Zoitis for partnering with us and providing us with Dr. Tamara Kwasnick. Um, she will be um, presenting today and um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you can use the little chat thingy. So you just type your question into the chat box and uh, we have the lovely Jocelyn Adams, our Horse Council BC Marketing and Coordinator, Communications Coordinator. Um, so she'll be handling all that for us today. And so we'll get going and I introduce to you Dr. Tamara Kwasnick. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and thanks for, for having me out in BC. I think that's my only regret about our, our current circumstances in having a webinar is that I'm not able to join you in BC. I hear that it's lovely this time of year, but I'm coming to you from East Central Alberta. And like Sandy said, I am with Zoetis. I am the equine lead for the technical services team for Zoetis Canada, but I'm also a rancher and a horse owner myself. So I can fully appreciate the challenges of horse ownership and hope to provide you with some very practical information here today. Uh, just while I'm delivering the, the rest of the content and, and Jocelyn puts the screen up, I am uh, just gonna jump off camera here, um, but we'll be monitoring for questions and uh, Jocelyn will and Sammy will, will let me know as you guys have them, we can address them as they come up or we'll have some natural breaks where we can circle back and uh, ask for any other questions. So today we're gonna focus on some critical but routine preventative healthcare recommendations for your horses. So I'm gonna share with you what I think you need to know to make informed decisions about your horse's care and help decide what is essential in a year like this, like I said, from a very practical perspective. So I could do my, my best guru impersonation here. So when someone asks why your horse looks nice, but you look homeless. In terms of money, we have no money. So it's true, as horse owners, we'll put so many hard-earned dollars into our horse's care and often neglect our own. I can honestly say that my horse's teeth receive professional care more often than I do. But all jokes aside, this year is tough all over and the horse industry hasn't been left unscathed. So if we look at the next slide, uh, Equestrian Canada did some surveys earlier this spring. And one of the figures I wanna draw your attention to is this $163.83 down in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. That's the cost per horse per month on average for feed, forage, and bedding only. If you factor in yardage, boarding, and care costs, that number is closer to $350 per month per horse on average. So far and away, the biggest recurring cost of horse ownership is feed. You know, our other things that we do in terms of preventative care are just a fraction of that, that ongoing recurring cost. I'm sure we've all forked over the, the cash for, for loads of hay and, and know how near and dear that can be. So we're going to bring up a poll question here uh, just to give you guys a chance to get used to the, the polling format as uh, Jocelyn just flips back and forth. Just to get you familiar with answering. We'll have a few of these, these coming up. So you can just answer directly on your, your computer. So when it comes to, the, when thinking about your horses, what concerns keep you up at night most frequently? Can I afford to feed them? What will I do if my horse gets sick or hurt? Why is my chestnut mare so evil? Or that middle of the night, snap your eyes open, did I turn the water hose off? So we'll give you a, a moment to submit your answers and then we can see the tabulated results.
we might, uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so we can see that uh, the major concern of uh, this, this quick list of things that keep us up at night about our horses is what will I do if my horse gets sick or hurt? Maybe I'm the only one with a chestnut mare that uh, <laughs> is, is not uh, so pleasant, but I see some of you have had uh, the issues of an overrun water trough. So that's just to get us uh, loosened up a little bit and, and uh, familiar with how to use how to use the poles. But uh, we can see from the responses that uh, even if it doesn't happen to keep you up at night, we're all concerned about the health and well-being of our horses. Sick horses are challenging. They're challenging to treat. They're a challenge to our stress management, and they challenge our pocketbooks. But on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis, what defenses do our horses have to protect themselves from infectious disease? Basically, we can categorize their defense systems into three different parts. There's physical barriers, there's their innate immunity, and then there's their adaptive immunity, which we'll explore in the upcoming slides. So when we're talking about physical barriers that our horses have, these are things like skin and hair, which we can see in the ears of the upper left picture. So these have the ability to keep pathogens from entering the body. We can truly understand the value of skin when it's not there. One of the reasons wounds can become infected is there isn't that barrier to the outside world. Also, there's the skin glands which secrete lipids and other substances that help perform, or excuse me, help form this protective antimicrobial layer uh, on the skin. In the upper right, is a picture of a gastric endoscopy. This is what the inside of a stomach looks like. This glandular lining, it secretes acid, which is important for digestion, but it also neutralizes pathogens that happen to be ingested. Down on the bottom left is a picture of an opening into the trachea. So this is what um, an, an endoscopy of the upper airway can look like. And so that opening with the little, um, under the little peak, is the opening into the larynx. But the cells of this epithelium, they secrete mucus, which helps trap particles and pathogens that are inhaled. And then if we go further into that triangular dark little cave and down into the trachea, that epithelium is lined by cilia. And so that, a close-up picture of that is what is on the bottom right. And those cilia, they can trap particles and pathogens and then sweep them back out to the opening and that helps limit the number of particles that make it down into the lower airway which is more susceptible to infection. So it's these physical barriers and defenses that are really the first line of defense that a horse has. Moving beyond physical barriers we then have innate immunity and this is the first responders that kick in once a pathogen makes it past those physical barriers. Inflammation is activated, which helps to trap and isolate the invaders. Complement, which is a set of proteins that are in circulation and in tissue, they can help destroy pathogens in a very non-specific manner. And then there's these macrophage cells, which are white blood cells that are then in, uh, in the tissue and at the site of entry, and these macrophages can then actually ingest and digest things it recognizes as foreign. So if you think of the innate immune system like an on-site security guard, you can see that they would be effective at controlling low-level threats, but can be overwhelmed by a bigger challenge. These security guards only have so much in their arsenal, and they don't often have advanced tactical training for dealing with more advanced pathogens. But importantly, these security guards can help slow the invader and then they can call for help when needed. So if the innate immune system are the security guards, the adaptive immunity is the police force, complete with a SWAT team. And we'll just look at that on the next slide. So much like a police response, these cells aren't on site, but get called in when a threat is detected. 
One of the important characteristics here is that a pathogen needs to have been identified and the cells that are responding are trained for that response, much like a tactical unit would be. This is the part of the immune system that builds up pathogen-specific antibodies, which are made by B cells, and then also develops more cell-mediated defenses, like cytotoxic T cells, which actually can recognize and, and kill invader pathogens. So it is this branch that we work with to stimulate with vaccines. So vaccines can be thought of like training exercises that allow the tactical team to prepare and be on standby. So if we think in, in a global sense of the whole horse, vaccines aren't the only thing that help keep your horse from getting sick. There are many different things that can help your horse fight off disease. Appropriate nutrition is, is key. All the physical barriers are constantly regenerating themselves and require proteins, minerals, and vitamins to make the most effective barriers. When we think about exercise, either too much or too little can impact the immune response. Either sedentary and obese horses on one end of the spectrum and then overworked horses are more susceptible to disease. This next one on the list, socialization, you know, this makes fly in the face of, of current social distancing recommendations, but socialization is an important aspect of preventing disease in horses. And this is because horses are prey animals and designed to be in groups. And horses that are living in isolation are more stressed. And so they require social contact to minimize that stress. We do know that stress is very immunosuppressive. So things that we can do to minimize stress will help prevent them from contracting infectious disease. Another important factor on our list is parasite management. Highly parasitized horses are more likely to develop other infections. And this could be due to the fact that those internal parasites are robbing the horse of critical nutrition, or these parasites also secrete compounds that help modulate the immune response. And so the presence of parasites can be immunosuppressive because of the direct actions of compounds that those worms are secreting. If we also think of external parasites like flies and mosquitoes as, uh, as vectors of, of disease and something that needs to be, con that can be a key um, intervention strategy uh, in minimizing our horse's exposure to disease, that's just another, another thing to consider with our parasite management. If we can keep uh, mosquitoes from landing on our horses, we can prevent a lot of different diseases. And if someone has a 100% surefire way of, of doing that, please, please let me know. And then biosecurity. So this is more in line with our, our current physical and social distancing recommendations. And so this is limiting the contact with other horses and animals outside your own herd. This is a very important control strep and also uh, represents a certain degree of, of risk for horses that are frequently in contact with new horses. And then finally on our list is, is vaccination. So this is a strategy to really enhance that adaptive immunity of your horse. So it's not just vaccines that are, that are critical in keeping your horses from getting sick, but it is something that uh, we can do to enhance their immune response in a very meaningful way. So then, what should we vaccinate our horses for? Broadly, diseases are classified into core and risk-based diseases, and we'll see a list of them on the next slide. So what that defines the, a core disease is something that a horse can catch in their field, regardless of what their role is in life, whether they're a pasture ornament or a road warrior, the core diseases are something that can affect a horse anywhere it's at. It's because these diseases vectors are either found in the soil in terms of clostridial spores that uh, cause tetanus or for things like um, mosquitoes that transmit West Nile and, and sleeping sickness. This is in contrast to the risk-based diseases, which 
a horse's um, exposure to really depend on what they what they do for a living or the um, contact that they have with other horses or certain circumstances. So we dig down a little further on these core diseases. Any of the core diseases can be fatal. And like we had talked, all horses can be exposed to it, the infective agents, whether they're just in their stall or pasture. The disease really comes to them. And another key fact about these core equine diseases that we vaccinate against is that few, if any, treatment options exist. So this makes prevention very critical when our treatment options don't often lead to a successful outcome. So if we take a look at the mortality rate for these diseases on, on the next slide, we can see some pretty staggering numbers. When we look at rabies, a case of rabies is invariably 100% fatal. We don't have treatment options for this virus. When we look at tetanus, it carries a 60 to 75% case fatality rate. And I would expect that that would likely go up, as we'll talk in a minute, that one of the treatment options, tetanus antitoxin, is no longer available. West Nile carries a 33% mortality rate. And then our sleeping sicknesses, so Western equine encephalitis virus and Eastern equine encephalitis virus, um, they carry a 50 to 75% or higher mortality rate. So very high odds that a horse will succumb to the disease if they contract the infection. Those are not odds I would want <laughs> to bank on for sure. But let's talk about West Nile for a moment. So like I had mentioned, cases of West Nile have a 33% mortality rate. But of the horses that survive the initial infection, 40% of those go on to have persistent neurologic deficits that would be career altering for them. You'd have a horse that may be suitable to, to hang out in the pasture, but the ataxia and muscle fasciculations that become a permanent feature make that horse unsound to ride. When we look at the protection that's offered by West Nile vaccines, you reduce the risk of them contracting the disease by 97%. Now, those are odds that I would bank on. There's a video clip here on the left-hand side of the screen, and this is um, a gelding that I saw in practice a few summers ago. Um, he was unvaccinated, and this is an early stage West Nile case. And so these are the muscle fasciculations that, that we start to see that are persistent. And unfortunately, this horse, ended up being euthanized. His neurologic signs progressed very rapidly. And um, it was just, it was, a, you know, I didn't show any of, of his, um, his head in this video because you could just see the visible pain that this, this horse was in. One of the other effects of the virus is that it makes the horse hyper aesthetic. And that means that any stimulation or a low grade painful stimulation is uh, perceived as much worse than, than what it is. So this, this was an unfortunate case and just served to me as a reminder of the value of vaccinating against West Nile. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you know, being in BC, do we, do we see a lot of West Nile? Is this a huge risk for our horses? And there have been reported cases of West Nile in, in birds and people, and then also in horses. Um, in BC. And, and, and Gord, we'll, we'll talk about rabies here in, in upcoming, so your question. Uh, we can have similar um, symptoms in, in, um, in rabies cases. Uh, and the kicker about rabies is that it can be very variable, uh, so it can make it hard to, to diagnose in the initial stages. But stay tuned for that. So um, if we look at the numbers, and this is one of the animated slides, Jocelyn, so if you'll just click one more time for me. Um, and then again, we can see the breakdown of the cases. So while the number of cases in BC aren't yet as large as in other areas, it's still, 
you know, the virus has still reached BC. This was something that landed on the, the east coast of the continent and has made its way west. So we do know the, the virus has made it across the mountains. And since we don't have great control over the vector spread and the reservoirs, whether that be in migratory birds or mosquito patterns, um, we're at the mercy of many ecological factors when it comes to the spread of West Nile. Or if you happen to travel with your horses, like once we, we get outside of our current circumstances, we can actually put horses on the trailer and, and go places. West Nile is certainly more prevalent in, in other regions. But given the, the high rate of both mortality and then the persistence of neurologic deficits, it is something that you would want to vaccinate your horses against. All right, I promised you a little talk about rabies. Um, let's take a little closer look at that. So this is another disease that we can't well control the exposure to because of the, uh, the reservoir of infection is in bats and, and other wildlife. And since it's fatal once contracted, vaccination against rabies is, is essential. So I have a couple little video clips to show here. Uh, the one on the left, I'm warning, it's just a little bit startling. So this is from my neighbor's own backyard here in Alberta. You know, <laughs> um, my friend, she did not know that the coyote was, was going to do that. She promises me she would have moved her daughter away from the door had she known that that was going to happen. But that would just serve as a reminder that neurologic disease is present in wildlife species all over. Uh, we did boost all the, the dogs, cats, and horses on this farm after this incident. It's more like most likely that that coyote was uh, suffering from distemper, a different viral disease, but uh, it just was uh, a timely reminder that the risks are still present. And this second clip of the paint horse with the, the little fox in the pasture, if you can see him skulking through the grass, this uh, just really serves to drive home the point that we don't always know what our horses are up to. And this is very weird behavior for foxes for anyone who hasn't been around them. And you can just, the owner happened, happened to be home and just thought this was weird and, and, and recording it. And then you can see where it gets a hold there and the horse kind of solves, solves the issue there. This, um, Fox was submitted for testing and he was positive for rabies. And so this horse had been previously vaccinated, so it had its rabies vaccine boosted and was observed um, and continues to do fine. But had they not witnessed this and the horse not been vaccinated, the outcome would have been very different. And so one of the challenges with uh, equine rabies is that we don't always have that stereotypical presentation of the mad, aggressive, foaming at the mouth type of cases. A lot of the times in the early stages, we just see a horse that kind of ain't doing right. Just that they're off, just really subtle signs. And one of the most common reasons that um, a horse with rabies is, is presented for evaluation is with suspicion of mild colic symptoms or choke symptoms. What really uh, gives it away that it's rabies that we're dealing with is the, the rapid progression uh, that these horses go through that, that culminates in, in death. And we have a lot of um, neurologic signs and, and bizarre behavioral signs, and then ultimately paralysis and, and death. Another thing that, that makes rabies um, a bigger risk in, in horses than in some other species is if we look at the, the next slide, just as a, an image, recall that rabies is spread in saliva. And then just, we'll just stop and, and think for a minute of all the things that we do near or in a horse's mouth, like whether we're bridling them up, whether we're checking their gum color, or whether we're just kind of doing that little breath share with them. We do have significant exposure with the end of the horse that can secrete this virus. So that's just something to keep in mind and one of the reasons that rabies vaccination is essential because then we can just take that worry off the table. When it comes to incidents of rabies in BC, we do see cases. We can look at the distribution map on the next slide. 
So across Canada in 2019, there was 116 positive cases of rabies. Eight of them were in BC, and one of them, unfortunately, was a human case. Rabies in people carries the same fatality rate as it does in, in other species, and uh, so that was just an unfortunate tragedy. Uh, I do believe that that was a bat vectored case, um, and the individual was, was bitten by an infected bat. But rabies is certainly something that is present in BC, and with it carrying a 100% fatality rate, vaccination against rabies is, is a critical preventative step. We can take a look at what rabies incidence looks like in the United States. And we can see um, you know, a distribution from east to west. And it should really grab the attention of anyone who travels south with their horses or their dogs like just those uh, number of, of cases that we see in the, in the southern states. Um, so that should be another reason for vaccination against rabies is if you travel south with your horses. The last core disease that I'm gonna touch on is tetanus. So unlike the other core diseases, it's not spread by insects or rodents, but rather it's in the soil or in the GI tract of animals. And so once activated and in an anaerobic environment, the bacteria produces a potent neurotoxin, which ultimately causes paralysis. And so this foal is exhibiting some of the, the, the classic signs of, of tetanus. It's got this rigid sawhorse stance. Um, and you can see that its, its tail is, is elevated um, and really in contraction or extension, pardon me. And, and that was a persistent feature. That just wasn't, you know, him having a bowel movement and just having to catch his tail. It was really like a pump handle kind of tail. Um, you can't see it well in the picture, but his ears are really pricked up. And we can start to see some elevation of his, his third eyelid on, on closer pictures. And so this is just really characterized by uh, muscle rigidity because that neurotoxin is, is acting on the nervous synapses. Uh, ultimately, these cases do lead to death because of uh, respiratory muscle paralysis. So they essentially asphyxiate in, in many of these cases if they're not euthanized prior to that happening. Like I had mentioned earlier, um, treatment is, is challenging because of the potency of the neurotoxin. And one of the things that we rely on is tetanus antitoxin. Unfortunately, that product is no longer widely available. So we really have to lean on preventative measures for reducing the incidence of tetanus cases in our horses. So we're gonna pop over to a poll question now. And we're just gonna you know, have some, some skill testing knowledge on, on tetanus susceptibility. So true or false? Since I only get a tetanus shot every 10 years, my horse can just be on the same schedule as I am. All right, so 100% of you said false. Nice work, that indeed is a false statement. Horses are much more susceptible to tetanus than we are. And then on the other end of the spectrum, cats and dogs, they are way less susceptible than, than humans and horses are. Um, we don't vaccinate our companion animals for tetanus because of their, their low susceptibility. Maybe it's a plug for being a strict carnivore. The more meat you eat, you're less likely to contract tetanus. But when we think about horses, the duration of immunity may be closer to, to two years rather than one, but annual vaccination is the standard of practice. And I would highly encourage annual vaccination and keeping those antibody levels at their highest since antitoxin is not available. So as far as I'm concerned, vaccinating for the core diseases is of utmost importance. The bigger discussion this year, though, 
is what about risk-based diseases like influenza and EHD, also called rhino, on a year where, just like me, my horses are staying home and the trailer's not going down the road? We'll take a look at them a little bit closer so you guys get a bit more information on which to base your decisions. If we look at some, some risk factors for both equine influenza and equine herpes virus, horses at more risk are young horses, you know, so under six or middle-aged and older, so over 10, and those horses that are in more frequent contact with outside horses. So from that list, you can see that that covers a lot of different horses that would be at risk. If we look at equine influenza specifically, we have some information on the next slide. And equine influenza, it spreads rapidly in susceptible populations. And so it attacks the respiratory epithelium. Recall our, our picture from the physical defense slide. So that's a normal healthy epithelium on the left-hand side of the screen. So what happens when the virus attacks it is it essentially wipes out that ciliated epithelium, leaving it quite denuded. And that's what you see in the middle picture. And this really sets up an environment where bacteria that would normally would have been swept out by those cilia get to set up shop and create an infection. And another thing that we see with equine influenza and other respiratory infections is the development of a chronic cough. And maybe you've experienced this yourself after a respiratory infection is that you're feeling better and you're over the initial stages of disease, but you have this cough that persists for weeks and weeks. And then if you exert yourself or you start exercising, that really exacerbates it. And that's because during these early stages, that damaged epithelium takes time to heal, and it's also very fragile for an extended period of time. So if you have a lot of exertion, um, you can damage that, that healing epithelium and really um, flame up some of that inflammation that can lead to a chronic and, and debilitating cough. So that's why the recovery from equine influenza can be longer, just because that epithelium needs time to heal. And then also it can be um, complicated by secondary bacterial infections. But really we're looking at at least three weeks of recovery time. Another rule of thumb we have in terms of, of treatment and convalescence for flu cases is for every day that that horse has a fever, they need a week off. So if you have a horse that, um, you know, it's febrile for four or five days, you know, that's, that's four to five weeks off. Um, with our limited season right now, as things open up, can you imagine having to give your horse time off after all of this, once you're ready to, to get out and, and go? When it comes to influenza vaccination, we can greatly reduce the amount of time that that horse would be febrile. So they would need way less time off in the event that um, they had a breakthrough in, in disease. So there's a lot of value in terms of reduced convalescence time with uh, influenza vaccination. So then if we look at equine herpes virus, there's several different types that have been identified, but type one and type four are the most common. So what you may not know about EHV is that the majority of horses are infected within the first few months of life, and then they're chronic carriers. Um, that virus just really hides out in the body. Herpes viruses, you may be aware, are the family of viruses that also call cold, cause cold sores in people. And so it's just a latent infection, and then it rears its head when um, there's times of stress, and that virus just really recrudesces and starts replicating and then can cause its issue. But that's something that pretty much any horse in Canada has the potential of, of carrying. It's just a matter of if the horse starts shedding it again and they're in contact with naive and susceptible animals. Typically, EHV causes low-grade respiratory infections, you know, snotty noses, lethargy, but depending on the type, we can see abortion storms result in pregnant mares and it can also cause neurologic disease. Something you may be seeing in the headlines right now 
um, is a recent outbreak at Woodbine Track in Ontario. And so this recent outbreak really drives home that even though we consider this season lower risk, it is still not no risk. And I have a bit of a, a press release on the next slide. And so this is, you know, the horse is at the track. There isn't a, com a competitive schedule going on when, when this occurred. There were horses there that were in training and had been a pretty stable population. There wasn't a lot coming and going. And we had horses that developed neurologic herpes. And uh, unfortunately, this also spread to another property, not by the uh, transport of horses, but by a trainer who is at both places. So this just, again, just drives home the idea that even though it's lower risk this year, it's still not no risk. So I uh, would recommend that horses that have been on a flu and rhino vaccine schedule maintain that. So we can take a quick look at our, our recommendations for equine vaccinations for the major diseases that we've talked about here today. Like I've said, and uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not here in person, so you can't see me standing on, on my soapbox, but if I were, uh, core disease vaccination is critical. And then these risk-based disease vaccines are still important, especially as things open back up and your horses are back in contact with other horses again. All right, I'll just have Jocelyn, I'll let you guys take a look at that and I'll have Jocelyn bring up our, our next poll question. All right, this is, I'd just like you to know that these uh, results are anonymous. So Gord isn't gonna track you down if you uh, say that you haven't vaccinated your horse. But uh, we'd like to know how often do you vaccinate your horses? Every year like clockwork, only when I know I'll be taking them somewhere, typically every year, but haven't this year. And then uh, our basically no vaccines was a Bush was president the last time I vaccinated my horse. An alternative option that uh, didn't fit in with our option list was uh, I bought the vaccines, but they're still sitting in my fridge. Raise your hand if that has happened to you. All right, we have a a bit of a, a mix of, of responses there. So I hope that um, the content from today has is, is helped you uh, consider your vaccine decisions and, and the value of them. But uh, for those of you who are, you know, I see that uh, typically every year, but having this year was not as selected, but if uh, you know, you're thinking of skipping this year, here's one more thing to consider. As we look at uh, this response of protective immune levels, we can see that we rely on a memory response to vaccines. So remember those tactical training exercises? They need to be performed frequently enough that the immune system has those cells ready to respond. If we wait too long in between our vaccine doses, we don't have that effective memory response. Uh, by and large, equine vaccines require a two-dose initial series. So we give them, like the first time that they've had a vaccine, we give them their first dose, and then in three weeks' time, we follow up with a second dose. And that just really elicits um, the cells in that adaptive immune system to be on standby and to really uh, strongly respond when those horses see that pathogen again um, in terms of natural exposure. So if we wait too long between the doses, we're back at uh, the stage where we need to repeat that initial series so that we can have that strong memory response. And so if you're thinking of skipping this year, when you go to resume next year for 
best levels, you're going to have to repeat that initial series. And so there isn't a lot of value to be had if at, you know, over the next two years, you need to give two doses. It's best to give one now and one next year and keep them on that regular schedule so you don't have that lapse in protection and you still have that strong memory response when they're revaccinated. So by skipping this year, you're not really going to save and you're just going to put your horse at risk. And then one final thing on, on vaccines that I would like to discuss is our immune, or excuse me, our immunization support guarantee here at Zoetis. Now, we're so confident in the value, safety, and efficacy of our vaccines that they're backed by the immune support guarantee. So you can think of this basically as vaccine insurance. If your horse is properly vaccinated with our innovator products, and get sick with what looks like something they were supposed to be protected from by the vaccine, your horse is qualified for up to $10,000 in diagnostic and treatment cost coverage. So we just want you to know that we stand behind our products and if there's any breaks in coverage that we will help support you in conjunction with your veterinarian in determining what is going on and treating them for a successful resolution. So that's, uh, you know, my, my thoughts on, on vaccines, especially during a, a challenging season. Um, if there's any questions on vaccines, I can take them now, or we can shift gears into our dental care discussion. Um, so in practice, I love doing fine dentistry. Um, I spent, you know, probably at least a third of my time working in, in horse's mouth. Uh, there's just so many things to see and do, and just so many instances where you had um, a dramatic impact on the quality of life for these patients. Um, I also like this, uh, <laughs> my neighbor Cody is the one looking over, over my shoulder there, and he's uh, you know, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. I just really appreciate the perplexed look on, on his face. So our question from Dale Clark is, uh, when you take your horse in for vaccinations, do they automatically do all of the different shots? Um, I think that would be, I wouldn't say automatically, like that would be something that they would discuss with you. Um, and so it's, it's good to have, have that discussion with your veterinarian as to what your horse is doing and the different risks that, that they may face. So, um, it's likely, if you know, if they were to do this something automatically, it's probably at least a basic, uh, what we would call three-way. So that's the Eastern, Western, and tetanus. Um, and in recent years, we've been able to add on these core diseases um, so that we have our core EQ innovator, which does cover all those core antigens in one shot. So that would be rabies, West Nile, the sleeping sickness, and, and the tetanus. But I wouldn't just assume that uh, your veterinarian is vaccinating them against all these things. It's definitely uh, worth having that discussion for them so you fully understand uh, the coverage that your horse has. Thanks, Dale. All right, so let's, let's do shift gears onto another common preventative health measure, um, our annual dental care. Um, you know, we have several benefits to routine dental care, and it can have a huge impact on your horse's well-being. Dental disease is a significant source of discomfort and pain in our horses. So by providing routine care, we can really maintain our horse's comfort. By maintaining effective anatomy, we can really improve feed efficiency for our horses. Doing this routinely rather than waiting for clinical signs of um, abnormal chewing and weight loss or drooling to develop really allows us to have um, prompt recognition and treatment of, um, treatment of conditions in early stages so that we're not um, behind the eight ball and, and leading to just salvage type situations when we're looking at just having to extract the tooth and then dealing with all the ramifications that that, that involves. So this is a situation where uh, an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure, for sure. And then the other benefit of routine dental care is that we may have improved performance 
and then also increase longevity. If we can increase the, the comfort of our, our horses and make them pain free, they're just going to be able to perform that much better. They don't have that distraction and they don't have that, that resistance to, to our cues, um, whether it be from uh, through, through the bit in our hands or even just the head stall on the outside of the face and, and the pressure that that can can elicit. Um, you know, you know, any of the trainers I ride, they're always telling me to use more legs than, than hands, but this is still something that's a significant source of um, difficulty if there's something going on in your horse's mouth. And I think many here probably have, have experienced um, those things with, with their horses. So to put us all on the same page, there are four types of teeth in the horse's mouth. There's the incisors, and so horses, they clip forage and then bring it further into their mouths um, with their action of the tongue and, and hard palate. And this is kind of in contrast to cows. If you've watched cows eat, that they use their tongue to bring the grass into the mouth and then shear it off with their, their lower incisors and then upper, upper dental pad. Then there's the canines, and those are the ones that sit in the, in the barge or the interdental space. Um, and at one point, these may have had a defense purpose. Um, right now, they're probably mostly useful for removing extra skin off your hands when bridling. And then sitting in front of the cheek teeth are the wolf teeth, which are, you know, a very vestigially um, underdeveloped type of tooth. Um, not too sure on, on its function, other than it can contribute to some different problems, especially in, in young horses. And these are teeth that are commonly removed. Uh, they're more typically found um, in in males, although about up to 80% of, of uh, female horses are mares and fillies, they have them 80% of the time. So wolf teeth are, are a common finding in both sexes, whereas canines are pretty much exclusively an XY feature. So we see them more commonly in, in geldings and, and stallions. We can see very vestigial canines in some, in some mares, well, they'll just have a little tiny um, eruption in that interdental space. This is just another instance where nomenclature is just a little bit, bit close, I, you know, between canines and, and wolf teeth. I feel like maybe we could have found a, a little bit uh, different imagery between the two, but the canines are those bridal teeth in the interdental space that are more common in males, and then wolf teeth can be in both uh, fillies and colts. And then there's the cheek teeth. And these are the grinding teeth. So these are the ones that really reduce the feed particle size and uh, really set the horse apart as uh, a species that can digest forage. So horses' are, teeth are different from ours in one major way that we can see. Um, they continually erupt as they're worn down. And so they have a huge amount of reserve crown. Uh, so they have what you can see on the right hand picture where the gingiva attaches uh, kind of in that upper portion of the tooth and then they have all that reserve crown as you go down to the bottom of the slide leading to the little nubbins of the roots and so a horse's diet is abrasive and they'll literally grind down their teeth as they go through those thousands of chewing cycles per day when we look at uh, kind of a slice of the anatomy, that infundibulum is an infolding of enamel. And when we see these on the incisors, that infolding is sometimes referred to as the dental cup. And it's these infoldings that really um, make a grinding surface on the tooth. We do have the infundibulum in the incisors and, and the cheek teeth. So this, these ridges is really what helps create uh, the mechanism by which horses can grind down that forage. So the next slide is a picture of a young horse mouth kind of close up. So we can see um, in the bottom right hand picture, if we were aging this horse, that it is under two and a half. And we know that because those are all baby teeth for those incisors. Um, you can tell by the shape and that they're, they're the whiteness of them. So those are all still baby teeth. So this horse is still quite young. Uh, the picture above that is the wolf teeth that were extracted. So in the left-hand picture, you can see 
that wolf tooth that just has a little bit of blood around it, just sitting in front of those, those premolars. And so we took those out of, of this filly um, because wolf teeth have the ability to cause problems. Their, their roots aren't often as well developed as the cheek teeth. Like recall the clinical and reserve crown on um, the cheek tooth in the previous picture and compare that to the roots on this one. So they can be in, have some instability that when there's bit contact, um, that can cause, cause some issues there. Another thing that can cause issues in our young horses is that the first three cheek teeth do have baby counterparts. And so those are what shed as caps. And they do that you know, between two and, and four years old. And so as you can imagine, if you have a tooth that, that's loose and, and pinching on your gums, that that can cause some, some pain and distraction while you're working in the bridle. So these young horses, it's really good to, to get in there frequently, um, to do things like take the wolf teeth out, to check for uh, loose caps, and also for proper eruption. If uh, we have retained caps and those adult teeth that are coming in behind it um, are delayed, we can really set ourselves up for some lifelong malocclusion. So it's really, Again, a situation where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And if we can correct them in the early stages of a malocclusion rather than waiting for a wave mouth when they're nine or 10 years old, um, we're further ahead to correct that now. So like our teeth, horses teeth are living structures. They have, uh, have pulp cavities with blood vessels and nerves just like we do. Um, so in, in the picture on the left, that really frond-like structure, that's the sensitive structures out of, out of a tooth. So they do extend almost down to the occlusal surface. And this is important to keep in mind when dental treatments are being done. If we're too aggressive in, in our reductions and our interventions, we can open up that pulp cavity. And if you've ever had an exposed um, pulp cavity in your own tooth, you um, can really sympathize with what's going on because they're, they're highly sensitive. And then that also is an avenue for that tooth to become infected and we can get those tooth root abscesses. And so this is something that's an important factor and you want to be aware of uh, because this and the position of these pulp horns often limits what we're able to do in terms of correcting a malocclusion and why we have to do them more gradually. So these pulp horns are always in the progress of, of, of regressing as that tooth wears down um, naturally, right? Like this is part of the tooing, tooing cycle, that pulp horn gets stimulation through vibration and pressure to regress. And those pulp horns are capped by dentin. And so that secondary dentin that you can see on the chewing surface or even on the incisors, so this is what becomes the dental stars that we see when we're looking um, to age an older horse. And as horses age, we can reach the portion of reserve crown that is narrower and more curved, which we can appreciate in this x-ray. You see the blacker slices in between the bright white teeth roots and reserve crown. As those spaces reach the mouth, there's spaces in between the teeth that are then primed for feed to pack in. And we know that feed packing, so we get, you know, um, hay and grain packed in around that tooth is the number one cause of periodontal disease in horses. Um, I have some pictures on the next slide of, of feed packing. And so it's, it's this that really sets off an avalanche of, of issues. So when that feed is packed in there, it allows for bacterial replication and inflammation. And then this can escalate to permanent damage to the tooth. And this can also be quite painful. And so one of the most important parts in preventing further development of periodontal disease is simply removing that feed packing. It's not a fancy or super um, complex treatment. It's just a matter of getting in that horse's mouth um, with a speculum in and then sedated and we can really clean out those, um, that feed packing. And then once we have that feed packing removed, we then have different treatments we can do to help keep the feed from packing back in. And this can range from kind of uh, dental amalgam type substances that we'll put around that tooth, 
or depending on that space and how it's constructed, sometimes it's a bit of a wedge or a valve. So sometimes we have to burr in between those teeth to make it easier for that feed to fall out. If you have really a wedge-shaped situation in between the teeth, that uh, feed can become really trapped and it's hard for it just to, just to fall out on its own. So if we can correct periodontal disease early and really intervene simply by just removing that feed packing, we can prevent the downward spiral that can end up in the loss of a tooth. And so the slide that's up right now, this is an end stage mouse in an aged horse. And you can see a gap on um, kind of mid arcade where that pink is, where there's a gap in between the teeth. And then also, if you look at the, the chewing surface of that tooth, it's quite smooth. We're really down to just those little root nubbins at that point in time. If you look a little bit further back in the mouth, um, you can see the, the darker spots on, on that uh, third tooth that that remains and um, that tooth is also not long for for this mouth but you can see why an older horse has trouble with feed efficiency if they don't have those infundibular ridges to grind the feed and reduce the particle size down um, I'm, I don't know if you've ever thought about a chewing cycle in in a horse but really a bite of, of hay only has one pass at, at each tooth as it makes its way to the back of the mouth. You can see those ridges on, up on the roof of the mouth on the hard palate. Every time they move, there is a coordination between their tongue movements and then the directionality of those hard palate ridges that really forces that food bolus backwards with each chewing motion that, that they make. So really across the surface of each tooth, it only has one, one kick at, at each tooth. So if we have a smooth surface, we're not effectively digesting or reducing that particle size. There's, uh, we know that the particle size, once it leaves the mouth, isn't greatly reduced. So what the bacteria in the hind gut have to work on and digest on is greatly determined by what happens in the mouth. So one of the things that we see when a horse has pain in their mouth is they, they alter their their chewing mechanics and they don't have as broad of an excursion. And so those stems of hay don't get ground across the complete surface of the tooth. And so we don't get that effective reduction of, of particle size. And so that's why routine dental care and keeping them comfortable can lead to increases in feed efficiency because they're more effectively chewing their food. All right, this, this, this is just a, a note to, to remember, like in a year like this, um, stay with who's been providing the, the care for, for your horses. Don't, don't be tempted to go to someone just because they're cheaper, because oftentimes you, you get, get what you pay for. So that's just my little public service announcement um, for that. Um, and then we have our, our fourth uh, polling question here. So true or false, floating is a procedure where sharp ridges are taking off the chewing surface of teeth. All right, so um, this, is, this is actually false. So when we're floating teeth, we're taking sharp points off the side, but rather not off the, the chewing surface. And this is just an important distinction uh, that floating is done to reduce the sharp points on those very edges, whether it's the, the cheek edges of the upper cheek teeth or the tongue edges of the lower cheek teeth. Um, we need those, those rough surfaces on the actual chewing surface to effectively grind the feed. So that's just something, um, you know, as a, as a litmus test for who's ever providing your dental care. If they're saying that they're um, smoothing out the, um, 
the chewing surface or the occlusal table, that's, that's, a, that's something that's a bit of a red flag. I've seen this done um, by people who did not know any better. And they thought, you know, they were smoothing out this, this horse's mouth and this horse could, could effectively not chew. They had no way to, to grind down their, their feed. It really needed to be maintained on some very soft feed for several years while their teeth continued to erupt and get back to a, a more normal state. So just please keep that keep that in mind. wasn't a trick question, but just more to to drive that that point home. And then we talked about um, how that one pass per tooth um, in a chewing cycle is what really dictates feed efficiency. So we float the sharp points on the sides of the teeth just to really make the the mouth more comfortable, so they can chew um, more comfortably. So again, just to circle back about the benefits of routine dental care. Um, yeah, that we can maintain comfort, we can improve feed efficiency, uh, prompt recognition and treatment of conditions in the early stages leads to better outcome. You know, it can often be as simple as just getting that feed packing out of there and changing the anatomy mildly so that it can't pack. And then we may improve performance and increase longevity in our equine partners. So just a final thought um, in, you know, the, the horses that we shouldn't skip would be the two to five year old. There's lots of changes as those baby teeth are shedding and we can really correct a lot of malocclusions more easily at that stage. If you have a horse that has been diagnosed with a malocclusion and um, because those teeth are continually erupting, we need to continually correct. And because of uh, the presence of, of pulp horns, we can only correct so much. So it's better to keep those horses on an annual schedule. And then our geriatric horses, I wouldn't skip on, on them this year. Um, you know, just removing that feed packing and looking for loose teeth and really keeping them pain free is, um, is something that's critical to do frequently in these horses because things can just change so frequently in those old horses mouth. All right, so we covered a lot of ground in the span of, of an hour. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to take them now. Or we, you know, if you reach out to um, the team at uh, the Horse Council and with any follow-up questions, we can address them in our, our next webinar. So kind of some to be continued moments. So thank you for, for giving me your ears today and the privilege of your time. Let me see if I can unmute you, Sandy. Oh, I did it again. I do that every <laughs> time. <laughs> um, thanks very much. That was, you know, the, the longer you have horses, it doesn't matter. You can still learn something. That was really good information. Um, so if no one has any other questions, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming once again. And thank you very much, the Whitest, for partnering with Horse Council on this three-part series. Um, don't forget, everybody, the next uh, session will be July 15th, and it will be discussing, we'll be discussing deworming, uh, deworming in dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll, um, we'll talk about some poop. Yep. Yeah, poop and worms. Who wouldn't want to talk yeah. about that? Um, stay tuned, yeah. Yeah, stay tuned. Don't miss out. So, and I also would like to let everyone know that um, Zoitis has provided us with some door prizes. So if uh, for everyone um, that was on the call today, you'll be entered into a draw to win a door prize. Uh, if you come on the 15th, you will be entered again. And then for our third session, which I think is the 22nd of July, um, if you, uh, visit us for all three sessions. Um, Zoetis has provided us with a really nice cooler. It's a value of $200. So that will be, you have a chance to win that too. So join us for all three. You win big. <laughs> Get good information and a cooler. <laughs> so all right. At that, I guess we'll say have a great day, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Thanks so Bye. much for providing this. Oh, you're so welcome. Glad you came. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone.